Welcome to the February 14th edition of the Locked On Leafs podcast. David Morissuti here. And on Valentine's Day, there might be some people having some mixed feelings about the Toronto Maple Leafs that they split a home-and-home home series against the Columbus Blue Jackets. I'll break it all down where it went well and where it went bad right here on the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, and welcome to the Locked On Leafs podcast, your daily fix for all things Leafs. I'm your host, David Morissuti from Sportsnet. Just a reminder, everybody, that Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leaf centric podcast. So be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast from for free. And make sure you're subscribing to us on YouTube so you get us each and every day, five episodes a week. Locked On Leafs, where you're where we cover your team every day. And just a reminder that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. And let's just say if you had some bets on the Toronto Maple Leafs, you probably came about with some mixed feelings and mixed results because they looked every bit of a contender and really strong team Friday with a 3 nothing win it away in their first game back from the All-Star break, only to look like the Toronto Maple Leafs team that seems to always have the same trends against teams that, frankly, are not supposed to be being the Toronto Maple Leafs, especially the Columbus Blue Jackets who find themselves in the basement of the NHL trying to be among the lucky suitors to get Connor Bedard. So Friday night, you're feeling great. Saturday night, not so much. And of course, today is Valentine's Day, so I'm sure many people are feeling the love for the Toronto Maple Leafs after what was just a roller coaster of a weekend. So it's just a little bit of a of an obvious recap here. You had the three nothing victory where Ilya Samsonov looked pretty good, although he said himself he didn't really feel he was at his best in this game. I mean, it's hard to tell when the guy gets a shutout, but everything kind of was just working for the Leafs. You know, it, it, they probably could have won that game by more than three, nothing goaltending was actually not too bad for the blue jackets who had probably the leakiest defense. I've seen a team have against the Leafs pretty much all year. And uh, just, he was at a, he was just out of sorts with his defense in front of him. He was like Corpus Al was just like, guys, really, we're just going to allow free breakaways to the net. Uh, the Leafs did, win this game three nothing is still it was a very convincing win and then going into saturday's game you have joseph lowell making his first start of the season the leafs are up two nothing they get that early goal from william nylander things are looking well second period it fell apart they allow the blue jackets to not only outshoot them miserably in the second period three goals allowed in the second period to allow the Blue Jackets to not only take the lead, and then going into the third period, the Leafs find a way to tie the thing up only to let Columbus take the lead again, and they would eventually win it four to four to three. And just just an all-around weird weekend for the Leafs because this was truly two games that looked that just showed two different sides of the Leafs. The one side, as I mentioned, were you you expect this is what we come to expect the least to play against a team that's not very good. They dictate everything. They're the ones who are pushing the pace offensively. They're the ones who are are forcing turnover. God, how many turnovers the Leafs had forced in this game? Mitch Marner and Will and Yander were just among the best on the ice at getting those turnovers and forcing those turnovers and getting and turning them into scoring chances. And then on Saturday, the Leafs just you have a, you know, a, a rookie goaltender, Joseph Wall, who's finally back in the NHL after a very tough year, considering he had to work his way back from a shoulder injury. He was really good in the NHL, finally getting his shot. And it's almost like the Leafs, the, when, when it comes to these goaltenders who are making their starts in these moments, 
completely leave the guy hanging out to dry. Absolutely hanging out to dry. Like what, what annoyed me the most about this game here was that not only that the Leafs lost this game, but they allowed the Columbus Blue Jackets to get 40 shots on goal in this game. When the night before the Leafs had beaten the Blue Jackets 3 0, Columbus only had thir- now only had 30, and obviously the third period, the Leafs were kind of they were get, they were they had the lead and Columbus was pressing a little bit more. But that that's the part that was frustrating was just how different those two games were. And obviously there was a lot to kind of take from it. Uh, Sheldon Keefe's had some very pointed comments about the team's play. I'm going to break that down a little bit later in the show. Um, I think the first thing I wanted to bring up that I kind of had a problem with right off the bat, Michael Bunting. In that second game, I thought he was going to have a great game because he gets that goal. You know, he's, he's looking pretty good. And then the guy just decides to lose all composure and take some really dumb penalties. Now, look, I know that people have been very hot against the refs when it comes to Michael Bunting. They have it out for him. He's, you know, he's got a target on his back. So people are, the refs have it out for him. And oh, poor Michael Bunting's not drawing the calls that he usually draws. I get all that. But you cannot, and I repeat, you cannot give the referees a reason. This is what I, I talked about this before. And I, I, I kind of think that you cannot give the referees a reason to, you know, give the referees ammunition against you pretty much like don't, I understand you want to play with an edge. I appreciate the fact that Michael Bunting plays with the edge and I wish more players on the team did so. I really do, but there's a time in a place to do it. And there's a right way to do it as well. You know, when you talk about, you know, the other teams that, you know, like the Brian Marchands, I, I can kind of put Brandon Gallagher into that realm a little bit there. Like those guys just know when to do it and the, and the situations have to be right. Yeah. Once in a while, those guys do get reprimanded by the refs, but they, you don't want them, the refs to kind of feel exhausted. They kind of have to keep trying to rein you in. And look, Michael Bunting at times, very justified when he has shown frustration, but in a situation, in when it comes playoff time, the last thing you want Michael Bunting to do is to take undisciplined calls because he's not getting his way on the ice or he's frustrated because he's not getting his way on the ice, whether it's right or wrong. So I think this should be a big lesson for Michael Bunting after uh, a weekend like this. But there was a bigger, bigger lesson to be learned here from the Leafs, especially from head coach Sheldon Keefe, who I thought had some pretty – pretty pointed words about you know how the team played in that Saturday game so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on the other side so we're going to take a short break but before we get into our next segment let me talk to you about today's show sponsor and of course that is the FanDuel Sportsbook the new fan, uh, sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network and we're midway at the midway point of the NBA season here and now is the perfect time to download America's Number one sportsbook, FanDuel, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars. That's bonus bets back if you do, if you if your first bet doesn't win. Just download FanDuel sportsbook app. It's safe, it's secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drain. And of course, in the NHL, you can bet on who's going to win, how many goals they're going to score, how many goal- scores a guy is going to score. My favorite is, you know, how many shots a certain player is going to get in the game. Thanks to Mike for that tip. So you can always find a way to, you know, dress, put together your own parlays and make sure that you're maximizing each and every bet, especially now with the NBA All-Star game coming up soon. You're probably going to want to look to get in on the, you know, NBA All-Star game MVP who could lead the game in points. I know those are silly bets to make sometimes, but they're the ones that usually pay out pretty well. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at bigger payout with a same game parlay, as I mentioned, and some of them even have some suggestions for you. They're not all that bad either. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet 
up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA and of the Locked On Podcast Network. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. David Morrisuti here. We cover the Toronto Maple Leafs each and every day, five shows a week on podcasts, YouTube, wherever you get them from. So make sure you go and you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you're also liking these videos on YouTube. You're commenting. Let us know how we're doing. I mean, there are people who are calling. Let us know how we're doing. Let's get more of that going. We want to continue to raise our subscribership up. So make sure you keep uh, going to do that. And make sure you're telling all your friends about it as well. We always appreciate when people shout us out. So uh, always appreciate the support there. Now, when it comes to the Leafs, play this weekend against the Columbus Blue Jackets. I was actually listening to uh, the Kipper and Bourne show on Sportsnet 590, and they had Bruce Boudreau on. And, of course, they have to ask about the Leafs when they have Bruce Boudreau on. He's a big Leafs fan. He used to play for the, you know, back in the day. And they were asking him about Sheldon Keefe's comments after the game. And I'll, I'll first off, I will uh, kind of read out Sheldon Keefe's comments here where He called out the team's effort in the loss in very pointed kind of comments about to the team as well. So um, first, I think they were, you know, asking Keith about, you know, kind of what he thought was kind of going on. Like, you know, it was a little hard to kind of explain at times, but he says, I can't kind of explain the result. You guys talk to the players and he's talking to the reporters, obviously. I'm sure you asked them the same questions. I can't do the work for them. I thought that was a very, very important comment there. I can't do the work for them. Basically saying, I gave them a game plan that could, that should, I mean, it worked on Friday night when they beat the Columbus Blue Jacket. Pretty similar game plan on the Saturday night with adjustments, obviously by what they saw against Columbus. So the, the he's basically saying the game plan's there. They got to go and execute it, and they got to put an effort out. I can't do that for them. That's basically what he's saying. And he he goes on to also say they have to make a decision as to how important it is to them. That is really it. He's basically saying, you know, they have to show how much they want the, they want to win this year. Because, you know, there are times where things get difficult and the Leafs kind of just shut it down a little bit. Against the Columbus Blue Jackets, that was still... And the problem the problem I had with that loss on Saturday was that was still a winnable game. It was a one-goal loss. They had chances. And yet, they allow guys like Marchenko, Kent Johnson, to put the game away from them. You know, I look at when you had, um, you know, Joseph Wool pretty much under siege from the second period on, you know, nobody, nobody battling in front of the net, nobody helping with those loose pucks. Um, You look at the game winning goal, Justin Hall casually letting the blue jackets player establish position in front of him. Joseph wall doesn't really see him a shot. That's going wide gets tipped into the net. Joseph wall has no chance on it because Justin Hall isn't doing anything in front of the net. Like the, the thing is, we haven't really had a reason to not like Justin Hall lately. He's been fine. He's been decent. Hasn't really made many mistakes. That was probably one of his worst games in a long time. And the problem here is, is when he's not playing well, it, it leaves me to wonder, can he, can he, is this going to be too much for him when the playoffs come around? Like, like, is he going to be able to win those battles that he just lost in this one game against Columbus? Because it's not the first time we've seen it. And it's not just Justin Hall. I'm not going to just pick on him because there were other players that were very guilty of this. But he is somebody that is supposed to be a shutdown defenseman or being on a shutdown pairing with Mark Giordano. And that's not shutdown play. That is way too easy in front of that, not boxing guys out, not even helping his goalie. Like 
there was the I think it was uh, the second goal of the game. There was one goal where he's going to the net. The puck goes by him, and there's a Blue Jackets player behind him that just puts it into the net because he's. It's like he's playing nobody. There's no support for the goaltender and for the, the play in front of the net. Those things are going to be killer in the playoffs. And Sheldon Keith didn't just take issue, and he took issue specifically with the David Kampf line with Pierre Engvall, who did, who did get po- benched for not clearing a puck at one point in the game. You know, and he said, and Sheldon Keith said, it's not just Pierre, it is the whole line. Those guys in particular were our best lines on Friday. They had good things happen tonight as well, but we need to be able to really consistently, basically consistently play like they've played all season. They have to be competitive. They have to be great defensively. They have to be physical. When all that slips, it's not acceptable. It is really as simple as that. The thing is, Pierre Engel has had his ups and downs. He hasn't been bad lately. He's actually been playing better. But he's Sheldon Keefe is definitely right that when that line isn't doing it defensively, when they're not physical, when they're not really engaged defensively, it shows. David Camp, you know, he's he's had he has a lot on his plate. I totally get that. He's playing the third line center role, probably should be the fourth line center in this case, or having a little bit more support as that third line center. I mean, right now, Kelly Yarncroke is up in the top six. Uh, so is uh, Kerfoot. That really takes away your depth and kind of, you know, Yarncroke helps with that line a little bit more. So I don't, this is kind of where, and I, we're going to get into the trade stuff a little bit later here on the show, but it makes you really understand why a forward or two, I don't even think one forward is going to do it right now is going to be something that this Leafs team is going to have to explore at the trade deadline. Um, so this week, the Leafs are going to have three games. Uh, they're going to have a few games here against teams that are clearly in the Connor Bedard sweet stakes. You got the Chicago Blackhawks on Wednesday. You have the Montreal Canadiens on Saturday. And then you have the Chicago Blackhawks again on Sunday. Like, really? The, aim, the goal should be to win all three games. Okay, I understand one of them is going to be on a back-to-back, but it's the Blackhawks and it is the Canadians. Two of those games are at home. The Leafs are going to have between from the Saturday game against Columbus. They won't play. They weren't aren't going to be playing until Wednesday. They're going to have ample time to rest, to really work on whatever they need to work on. Maybe the uh, outdoor practice at City Hall kind of give them a chance to kind of reset a little bit here. I don't know after that loss, but like. Tampa Bay is right behind the Leafs' tails, right? Two games in hand, and the Leafs' advantage right now is they got to hope Tampa loses a game so they because right now Tampa would move ahead of them in percentage points, in, in points percentage in the standings. Like, the Leafs can't be losing these games. And that, until they kind of understand that, until that, and this is what Shelton keeps kind of telling them, kind of, he's, this is the message here. Until they want it, until they're saying we want to make our lives easier on ourselves, winning these games that they should be winning, they're going to get what they deserve if Tampa moves past them. Simple as that. They've been, it's the last 10 games, both teams are 6 3 and 1. But Tampa, if you look at the, kind of all the other stats, they've actually kind of been playing better than the Leafs. But the Leafs have also had. You know, the the luck of that, they played more games than Tampa. They've accumulated more points, but they're going to have to really step it up between, you know, now and the rest of the season. Because it's, it's a dogfight right now for second place. Home ice is going to be crucial. It is going to be crucial come playoff time. So we're going to take one more break. And when we come back, I'm going to give some thoughts on some news that we heard over the weekend over a particular trade target that looks to be off the lease radar right now but before we do i want to give a a shout out to one of our show sponsors and that is athletic greens i was somebody that was trying to you know take better ownership over my health wanted to have something that was going to optimize my gut health energy system i'm not one 
to have to obviously constantly remember to take pills and vitamins every day, especially different times in the day, different types of, you know, of pills, one to take with water and, and food, one, like, it just becomes too much. That's why I like AG1 because with one delicious scoop of AG1 in a glass of water, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. It helps me start my day off right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous, your nervous system, your immune system, energy recovery, focus, and aging. I'm somebody that's a very, you know, simple every day. I actually have uh, provided some samples to some friends and family, and they seem to like it too. They all say, wow, it's pretty convenient what you're getting with one scoop every day. They like that, that, you know, the fact that you're getting it all in one scoop. It's so, so easy. And the best part is it only costs you less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. It's cheaper than getting all the different supplements yourself. You're investing in an all-in-one nutritional insurance. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews. It's recommended by professional athletes, trusted by leading health experts such as Tim Ferriss. And right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition it's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast, your team every day. And we are going to be giving you content now five, always five days a week. We are here providing you all the great content that you love about your Toronto Maple Leafs. And things got a little interesting on Saturday night. You know, we hear just before the Arizona Coyotes were about to play a game that Jacob Chikrin was being a scratch. And this is, and, and we were talking about this in the Discord when kind of things were breaking out, but they actually were in saying that they were scratching Jacob Chikrin for trade related reasons. And oh boy, did Twitter get into a tizzy on that one? Because now it's a matter of if you're scratching a player for a game, now obviously if a trade's in the works, a team that's interested in acquiring him is going to say, well, we don't want this guy playing right now. So. You know, we don't want uh, him to suffer an injury. And we know Jacob Chikorin has been through a few injuries uh, this year. So it's very, it, it makes a lot of sense why he was scratched. But I was under the impression that when I saw that tweet, that, that a trade was close to happening. Like I thought maybe that night, maybe the next morning, just to kind of touch, find, get the final touch together. And then nothing. Uh, Jeff Merrick. Obviously, coming out on Hockey Night in Canada, reporting that the Leafs and the Oilers were basically not among those teams trying to lock down Jacob Chikrin. Maybe in a way, they the and Ali Friedman kind of noted this in Thirty Two Thoughts, uh, the podcast, saying that maybe this was also Arizona letting contending teams know that we're serious about moving this guy by scratching him, and we're close to getting a deal done because if the Coyotes weren't close to a deal. They are going to try to keep showcasing him. But at, at this point, uh, there's no reason. Even uh, even the Coyotes coach says he's not playing until this whole thing is resolved. Either that he's off the market for the rest of the year or they get a trade done. So really going to be interesting to see how all that plays out. So how does that really impact the Leafs? Obviously, this is locked on Leafs. We have to make this about the Leafs. The... The news here is that it looks like the LA Kings are among the front runners for Chikorin. And I mean, at the point of, at the time that I'm recording this podcast, um, the, he is still a member of the Arizona Coyotes. We were hearing that it was the Kings that were kind of making the big run here. So I think, I think uh, Greg Wyshynski reported that the LA offer was Gabe Velarde a first round pick last summer. Obviously, the Coyotes have been adamant on getting multiple first-round picks, which, I mean, considering what you're getting back and what Chikorin is already signed, 
you know, for, for he's got, a, he's got, he, you know, you're not having to worry about a contract right now. I understand why, you know, they're asking more. So Frank Sarvalli actually tweeted out when, uh, you know, when he was talking about kind of chicken here, he said, if the Yotes, if Coyotes and apparently the Coyotes are willing to retain money on chicken, but if the Coyotes are willing to retain salary, with sources suggest to Saravalli that they are, that is one way for Arizona to extract the asking price they've been seeking. It would also engage a whole swath of teams. So while Jeff Merrick kind of noted that the Leafs aren't among the teams right now, that doesn't mean they can't change. I think what the Arizona Coyotes are doing right now is they're trying their very best to see if they can really drive up this price. Because obviously, if a team was coming with the trade that they wanted, this deal would have been done. Chickering would have been gone because the Coyotes would have had the assets. They want to make sure that they finish as low in the standings as possible to get Connor Bedard. So clearly, they're trying to figure out ways to get this price done. And it's a little interesting to hear that Chickering, that the Coyotes are looking to maybe take back some salary because his cap hit is four point six million for a top four defenseman. That's excellent. He has two more years left at four point six million after this season. So if they retain salary, whoever whatever team is acquiring him is getting a heck of a deal. I mean, they're gonna have to pay up for it, and you know, retaining salary obviously allows the Coyotes to really maximize that return. But now you're wondering, okay, do, is there a team? that the Coyotes really want to do a deal with that doesn't want to pay up the price. And they're saying, well, maybe if we add this little extra bonus in here, we can really get it done. It also speaks to how many teams look at their cap the next few seasons and are wondering how will this deal fit into it? Although 4.6 million for a top four defenseman, I can't see why teams wouldn't try to do that. That a lot cheaper than what I've seen some, some free agents get <laughs> In terms of, you know, and even guys that aren't even top four. We talked about Eric Brands, and he's not a $4 million defenseman. Columbus Blue Jackets gave it to him anyways. So, yeah, I, I this is going to be a very interesting, interesting situation. Right now, I would say it looks like the Leafs aren't getting him, but that can change. This might even change by the time this podcast is up. That's just the way things kind of go. So, It'll be interesting. All I think, I guess, maybe Leafs fans can kind of hope is that, okay, if the Leafs do not get Chickering, if they're truly out on him, he's got to stay in the West because it would be it would be a big punch to the gut if, let's say, Boston gets him. Although I don't even know if Boston has the assets that Arizona is kind of looking for in a deal for Chickering because I'm just kind of looking here. Boston does have all their picks, but those first round picks aren't going to be as valuable because obviously Boston is tops in the league. They're going to have finished with the, the, the best record in the league. So those picks are going to be late. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know too much. I, I mean, this is a more for a question on locked on Bruins from Ian McLaren. They don't really have, I don't know the prospects that I think, would attract a chicken type player in return. Maybe there is, maybe there's guys that, you know, in the system that they can try. It's probably going to come down to getting the best in terms of picks and maybe roster players. I like if they have a, you know, young roster players, they can throw into a deal. But yeah, if you're the Leafs, you don't want Boston getting them. I, I personally just don't think that's going to happen. I know they've been interested. Um, so we'll see how that all plays out. But Elliot Freeman did say that the Leafs remain eyes focused on a forward. And if you look at what kind of happened, you know, this weekend, I I just think a forward makes too much sense here just because um, – it puts it really improves the bottom of your lineup when you can add that top six capable forward that kind of pushes people down, right? Now, Yarn Kelly Yarncroke doesn't have to play in the top six unless there's an injury, 
knock on wood that when skies are healthy and everything's kind of working out, you don't have to worry that Cal Yarnko can be low in the lineup and really help that area, that part that's been, been kind of lacking a little bit here. Um, and then maybe you add some depth, right? If guys aren't cutting it, then you can bring it. You have enough, someone that you can bring into the lineup that's going to give you exactly what you need. I think they need to add some physicality up front. They need to add, I think, their penalty kill. Penalty kill is going to be something that's going to make or break this team. They're middle of the pack right now. They should be better than that. They're not. So that's something they're going to have to really work out, look at here. Um, in the Discord channel, uh, somebody brought up that the apparently there was a, a tweet about saying that the Leafs had interest in Tyler Myers, which I kind of shook my head. Like, if they're not in on Chikrin, there's no way in heck they're going to be in on Tyler Myers because his, his contract is far worse than what, like, Tyler Myers might even get bought out at this rate by the Canucks if they, if that contract is capable of being bought, bought out. Um, like, he has... After this season, he has one more season that's six million. I, even if you retain half of that, I don't even know if I want Tyler Myers at three million. I understand he's a big defenseman, but he's been questioned about his defensive play ever since he was signed by the Canucks. Everyone hated that contract. So Ali Freeman kind of poured, not even pulled cold water. He like took the fire extinguisher, made sure that there was just no remnants of any anything there to that rumor that is not her. apparently earlier in the season there was some talk about it but now the leaves are pretty much laser focused on a ford i think that's the right call we'll see we'll see what kyle Dubas can come up with he knows and kyle Dubas knows that when there's a need he always finds a way to kind of satisfy it one way or another it doesn't always work out we always think about back to the folino trade but those are things you have as a contender those are the risks you take and you just got to make sure that you're, if you're going to be limited in what your assets are, what you want to trade out, obviously they don't want to give up a first round pick or Matthew nice for rental. Then you're going to have to find, you're going to have to, and you're going to have to find areas in the market that maybe there's a player out there that nobody's really looking at and you can get on the cheap. I don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see what direction the Leafs go here. So we'll, we'll, that will do it for for today on the podcast. Thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked on Leafs podcast for free on all podcasting platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at the underscore more studio. Follow Mike at Mickey underscore Canuck and follow the show at Locked on Leafs. We'll be back with another episode Wednesday where we'll tee up the game against Chicago Blackhawks. But until then, keep it locked right here. Locked on Leafs.